Hello everyone and welcome to our monthly Pulse webinar where today we're going to be getting an update on Pulse diseases in the southern region for the 2019 season. My name is Prue Cook and I work with the Birchip Cropping Group and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. Some quick housekeeping on using the webinar software. Josh will take questions following his presentation. There's a Q&A window, which you should see at the bottom of your screen, and this will allow you to ask a question. Click Q&A to open the window, type your question into the box and hit send. You can also check send anonymously if you don't want your name attached to the question. Now let's get straight into it. Today's presenter is Josh Fanning from Agriculture Victoria based in Horsham. Josh is a pulse pathologist supporting the pulse industry with disease management through field-based research and extension. Over to you, Josh. Thanks, Prue. Um, so today, Prue's just introduced myself. I'll be talking on giving a brief update on pulse diseases and what we're sort of seeing around the season. So firstly, I'd just like to thank Prue Cook and the Birchip Cropping Group for organising this webinar. Um, and secondly, this webinar or the presentation that I'm delivering today isn't just my own presentation. Um, Jason Brand, Jenny Davidson, um, Sarah Blake and my manager Grant Holloway are all been involved in this. And so I'd like to thank them for helping me um, because their knowledge is greatly appreciated, um, particularly in South Australia where um, Jenny and Sarah are always um, taking phone calls and understanding what's going on. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank GRDC for their um, investment in this area because pulses are a significant crop um, and hopefully um, we're all managing those diseases as well. So firstly, I'm gonna go a little bit backwards in this presentation. I'm gonna start with my main messages um, and I'll follow up with them at the end as well, or a similar type of main message. So my main message is if, I, if you don't get anything out of today, um, it's apart from these, that would be fantastic. And it's really about knowing your region and the diseases of significance within your region and what you have to manage with the crops that you're growing. Um, so it's no good you putting large amounts of fungicides on if you're in the Northern Mallee or those drier areas. Um, compared to someone that's in a higher rainfall zone that's got a much greater yield potential and needs a higher input system. So secondly, monitor for disease. So if you don't know what's going on in your paddocks, get out there and have a look. Um, and if you can't identify something, seek assistance. And there's a lot of people out there with a lot of knowledge. It's not just myself that presents. Um, I'm new to this area, I've been involved in pulse pathology for a couple of years now, um, but only in this position of pulse pathologist for a year. And there's a lot more experienced pathologists out there and there's a lot of agronomists and other people and growers that have a lot of knowledge. So it's get out there and seek those people's assistance as well as others. But I'm always happy to pick up the phone. And I know Jenny and Sarah in South Australia and Rowan um, are always willing to take a phone call on disease. It's knowing the diseases and the resistance within your area. So know the disease resistance rating of your crop and varieties you're growing, and then you can tailor the system to manage those diseases. Um, and that resistance level that you're growing. Because not every crop and not every disease needs the same management in each area and each variety um, in each crop has a different resistance rating and there's some better than others. It's being proactive on your disease management and having a plan in place. You may not need the fungicides and it depends on where you are. In South Australia, it sounds like they're having a lot less rainfall than what we are in Victoria. And there's some areas in Victoria that are having a lot more rainfall than other areas. So it's being proactive and knowing what, you, what you're what you expecting in your area and what diseases you have to control and having those fungicides on hand um, in your system. And know where and when to get help. So know when you're out of your depth so you can basically seek that help before you get to that level and things go pear-shaped. So to start off the presentation after the main messages, I'm going to do a brief recap for those that aren't aware of what the changes in resistance ratings or two of the main um, resistance changes that we've seen within Victoria and South Australia at the moment. So within Victoria, the bean ascochyta resistance ratings have changed slightly. Pathotype 2, um, Sarah Blake's research at SARDI has shown that pathotype 2 of ascochyta in favour of beans is fairly widespread across Victoria and, South, and parts of South Australia or most of South Australia at the moment. 
So those in that black box at the top of the screen there that you should be able to see, the varieties Farrah, Fiesta, PBA Marm, PBA Rana and PBA Zara have all changed their resistance. So they've downgraded their resistance um, because of this pathotype 2 that's widespread. So we shouldn't be treating those varieties as more resistant now or MS for Fiesta. We should be treating them as more an MS, um, sorry, an MRMS for PBA Marm, Rana and Zara or are susceptible for Farrah and Fiesta. The other varieties um, remain resistant or more resistant or haven't changed um, with pathotype 2, and that's Neura, PBA Bendoc, PBA Samura, Aquadolce, and PBA Garima. So the other changes that we've seen are in less lentil ascochyta, and this one's particular for South Australia now. So beans was Victoria. In lentils in South Australia, there's been a resistance change for our two new um, two newer immunotolerant lentil varieties, and they're PBA Hurricane XT and PBA Hallmark XT. So both of those varieties are now rated MRMS in South Australia. They remain at MR in Victoria, and that's just because we haven't got enough evidence to change them at the moment, and we don't see too much Ascochyta in Victoria with our, with our surveillance activities at the moment. So they've remained at MR. All our other varieties um, have remained the same at this stage. It's really because of that um, lentil wheat rotation that we're seeing on the York Peninsula and some of those higher um, or better rainfall areas. And we're seeing that dominance of lentils that's caused that resistance breakdown. And so they've now got to be treated like an MRMS and have a slightly different management package because of that. So Ascochyta. I've just mentioned two of the rating changes, just so that we're all aware of what Ascochyta is for those new to the industry. I've put some pictures up there in some different crops. So favour beans are the one on the left. You can see that basically that brown necrotic tissue in the favour beans, lentils and chickpeas. And there's two stem lesions. So the picture second from the left um, is a favour bean stem, which is a lesion. And the big picture on the far right is of a chickpea lesion on the stem. So in both of those, it's causing a weakening of the stem. In the chickpea, it's resulted in that stem breaking off and you're not going to get any growth past that ascochyta lesion. But basically those leaf lesions that you can see there, the de determining factor in ascochyta are those black pycnidia in the middle. So that really highlights that it's ascochyta that you're looking at. Um, so it's getting out there and monitoring those crops and making sure you know what disease. So I'll go through a few diseases today. Um, but the, this is Ascochyta that we're looking at here. So lentil Ascochyta, um, it's not such a large issue in Victoria or not that I've heard and not that I've seen in my time and Jason Brand hasn't found it to be a large issue in Victoria, but it's much more an issue in South Australia that we're seeing. Um, so the basic yield losses that we're seeing in those MRMS varieties, Nipper and Nugget, we're seeing a 10 to 20% yield loss. Whereas you go to a moderately susceptible variety like PBA Flash, you're getting around the 30% yield loss in those more conducive years. Now, to talk about PBA Hurricane and PBA Hallmark, we haven't got lots of yield loss data on those varieties yet because that change in resistance has only happened in the last 12 months. But we're expecting, because they're now rated at MRMS, we would expect that to be more an MRMS and that 10 to 20% yield loss similar to our nipper and nugget there. So to control these diseases, we're really waiting until we've seen the diseases out there. And if we are getting high levels in our canopy um, prior to potting, we should be spraying. Um, but if you're not seeing high levels out there, it's probably not worth a spray. There's a number of chemical applications that can be applied or fungicides that can be applied to protect the crops. Um, chlorothanol we've seen is very effective. Azoxystrobin and tebiconazole, which is Veritas, um, is very good and Bixofen and Prothioconazole, um, which is trading as Aviator Expert. I believe that's the only one under that at the moment. And we've seen that slightly more effective than the others, but obviously there's a price premium for the more effective fungicides or what we've seen as more effective and whether that's a cost benefit relationship in your situation, is something you need to consider. But the big thing with Ascochyta is protecting that seed. You don't want that seed borne transmission to the following year if you're keeping your seed and you don't want that downgrading of the seed. So it's all about protecting the seed and making sure you've got levels that aren't going to get onto the pods and cause seed infections. And as I said, if it in crop, if severe disease symptoms become severe, um, then they may need an application in crop. 
So moving on to chickpea ascochyta now. Chickpea ascochyta, similar situation to lentil ascochyta, except it's a bit more aggressive. And this graph here is showing ascochyta blight infection. So it's a percentage of the plot infected, and this is stem lesions or stem breakages that we're assessing here. And we've got four treatments across on that um, with the four different colours. So the higher graphs on each one is higher infection, um, and that's the purple. And they're showing basically no fungicides. When we go to the red graphs or the red bars columns, that's our chlorothanolol fortnightly, which is not a strategy we, rec we recommend. It's basically our full control. And that's what we're seeing to set, try it basically. And then we've got two um, fungicide treatments in between. In green, chlorothanolol strategically. And then we've got a bixofen plus prothioconazole strategically. So that was one spray of bixofen plus prothioconazole last year up here at Curio in these trials. And the main points I want to point out is basically if you're growing susceptible varieties, which are those ones on the right-hand side of the screen, which are our PBA Monarchs, our Almaz, PBA Slasher, PBA Strikers, those sorts of things in there, they're in that MS to um, S, more S category. Basically, um, that S category, you want to be putting more fungicides out on those. And you can see when you move up to your Genesis 090, which is more on the left-hand side of the graph, that that purple one, which is our nil, so we've had no fungicide applied in a season like last year, which was a little bit drier, um, basically you're getting the same level of infection as what you've got in a fortnightly chlorothanolol spray in those susceptible varieties. So you're going to need a lot less fungicides on a variety that's rated MS, such as Genesis 090, compared to our susceptible varieties like PBA Monarch and PBA Slasher, um, or PBA Striker is very similar to those for those in Victoria that are growing that. Um, and we've got a range of infection levels there. Um, so that's basically the main point. We can move to a more resistant variety, but for that, we're in the middle of the season now, so you know what variety you've got in the ground. For those susceptible varieties, you'll need to apply more fungicides potentially, given the season. So this graph here is showing last year, and it's showing that basically, there was no yield significance between any of our fungicides. So we, in this trial here, it was a set of similar position to that last trial, except we basically applied 10 fungicide treatments from a nil to our fortnight, fortnightly chlorothanolol, and our yield is on the um, x-axis this time, down the bottom, up, and you can see there that we were having very, small, very low grain yields. But this graph here just demonstrated it slightly better, but we were having high, high grain yields in the Wimmera, but it was a similar situation um, last year with our one-ton yields. Um, and basically it showed that any fungicide was better than no fungicide and significantly different in a season like last year. So for those in the drier environments like the Mallee, um, then you basically need less fungicides and, it, and any fungicide is better than no fungicide. Whereas those that are in the higher rainfall environments may need a lot more fungicides to do it um, or to get complete control or control that's um, economically viable. So with ascochyta infection, it's a much more aggressive disease. And so the results I'm going to present here are just to highlight how aggressive that disease can be and why we spray fungicides. So this, uh, this, these pictures that I'm about to show are from Griffith University. Um, and it's basically showing what happens when a spore lands on a leaf. So when you've got a spore, an ascochyta spore that lands on a leaf, up there you can see basically the picture, pictures going from left to right. The, the spore starts to germinate and then you've got stem elongation. So this is after 12 to 16 hours of moisture. So this is after a rainfall event. 12 to 16 hours, you've got that spores germinated and that's starting to elongate. So some paddocks, you still can't get out in the paddock at this time. After 16 to 24 hours, that germ tube that's come from the spore is now going into the stomata if it's nearest to mata. After 24 to 36 hours, it doesn't matter whether there's a stomata or not, um, that germ tube can penetrate directly into the leaf causing a lesion. And that's within 24 to 36 hours. And within five to seven days, you've got those visible symptoms as pictured, like I showed you before with the ascochyta lesions. So this is in chickpeas. And then every five to seven days with those moisture, you can get more and more infection. So that's why it's such a aggressive disease 
and why we why we harp on about chickpeas in particular and protecting those crops. Um, and basically chlorothanolol, the fungicide, operates as a protectant spray. So you need to be spraying before the rainfall event because it stops that penetration of that germ tube into the leaf. The fungicide's more like our Bixofen plus Prothioconazole and our Azoxystrobin plus Tebiconazole. They can have a bit more of a um, fungicidal properties and they can actually take out that infection. So they so there is some evidence um, that possibly after a rainfall event, they may have some sort of impact on that and be able to kill a disease. But we're still trying to get more evidence on that. So the recommendation is to try and do it still before a rainfall event wherever possible, because we're saying whatever you haven't sprayed with a fungicide is basically unprotected tissue, particularly with chickpeas. So now just changing tact a little bit, I'm gonna move on to Sucospora or to bean diseases basically. And so a good interim was Sucospora. Sucospora we see causing 10 to 20% yield losses or from what I've read, 10 to 20% yield losses. It is out there um, in Victoria um, and South Australia, but it's usually controlled fairly well with the tebiconazole that comes out at our grass sprays. So I presume we're past that sort of level now, that four to eight node stage. Um, from what I'm seeing out there in our environment, we're just past that stage in most trials. Um, so that tebiconazole or mancozeb or metaram fungicide should have gone out there to control Sucospora where Sucospora is an issue, which is more our higher rainfall zones um, where our beans are grown. Um, and that usually will do a pretty good job for the season and hold it off um, from causing those yield losses. But if you are having a bad season with Sucospora with higher rainfall, then we may need to put out an Adelaide fungicide as well. So tebiconazole or one of those other fungicides do have a small amount of properties or can help with favour bean management in terms of chocolate spot as well. And here's some pictures of chocolate spot. It's basically those brown lesions um, that come across um, onto the leaf tissue. When we get to temperatures sort of in that 10 to 15 degree or 10 to 20 degree, sort of the high, slightly higher temperatures or milder humid conditions, and we have a lot of humid humidity in the canopy structure, this is when this disease can get quite aggressive and cause significant yield losses, um, particularly when it gets onto the flowers or the seed. And there's some pictures there on the right hand side, um, the lower right hand side of the screen there, of where chocolate spots gotten onto the flowers. Um, and basically causing disease there. Um, and we want to protect our seed and our flowers so that we can um, obviously yield well and keep a high quality grain. So for chocolate spot management, there is some varieties that are coming out um, that are more resistant and we have got some levels of resistance um, within the breeding programs. Yes, it's only a sort of an S, M, it's S to MS at the moment, but you can see those differences. And the breeding program has worked well and there are some more resistant varieties coming out in the next 12 to 18, um, 12, to two year, 12 months to two years time. Um, so it's about knowing your varietal resistance again and those susceptible varieties are going to need more control than the, than the MS rated varieties. Um, it requires those warm, wet conditions. So if we're getting lots of wind that's drying out the canopies, you won't need to apply as many fungicides. Um, but carbendism, if you do need to apply fungicides, carbendism or prosimidone fungicides are the most effective. Um, and in conducive spread years where you're seeing chocolate spot earlier in the canopy before flowering, you will need to put out a fungicide um, to protect the yield and grain quality. Um, whereas in other years, in a more dry year, you might just get away with one spray at mid flowering or early flowering. Um, and if, it, and if the season progresses, then obviously at pod set, you may need another one if we're getting lots of rain, lots of rainfall and we're getting warm, wet con conditions that continue on through the season. So moving on now to lentil and vetch botrytis grey mould. Um, similar system to chocolate spot, a carbendism spray will, will be quite effective at that, um, except lentil botrytis, lentil um, BGM is easy to control. It's really only a canopy closure spray in most years will be enough. Um, in a year like 2016, we saw warm, wet conditions continue um, and another spray to protect against BGM was required. Um, it's a similar situation in vetch, except what you call canopy closure, and we're starting to do some work on that now um, on disease management trials um, in vetch within the Southern Pulse Agronomy Program 
and with Birchett Cropping Group up through Victoria. Um, so hopefully we'll have some more information on botrytis grey mould in vetch continuing forward. But at the moment, it's about making sure that canopy is protected in some way, shape or form um, if you're going for economics, um, particularly with your vetch, but definitely with lentils. Um, so in a season like last year, um, or in the higher in the northern Mallee, you may not need a fungicide on your um, to protect against BGM um, in lentils, particularly if you didn't reach canopy closure, which a lot of people didn't last year. The other thing is, if you're growing a variety like Jumbo Twos, it's a resistant variety, so don't worry about a fungicide. You've already you've already got the varietal resistance. Let's rely on that. That's why the breeders spend a lot of money and time putting it into that varietal resistance. Um, and even in 2016, within the Wimmera, I didn't see any BGM in Jumbo Twos. So that resistance is quite good um, and quite effective. So it's about knowing that resistance and then applying fungicides at canopy closure if required. So now I'll move on to field peas. This year was a bit interesting for field peas. We had, um, particularly through South Australia, um, there was a really high black spot risk and particularly through the Mallee and Victoria and Wimmera, there was a high black spot risk through all the forecast um, put forward. And Jenny said that they are starting to see some black spot in South Australia come through. In Victoria, I haven't seen it um, too much in the Mallee at the moment, um, where there was a high risk and I haven't seen any in the Wimmera either. Um, but despite those high risks, we're still planning for a high risk black black spot season. In Victoria, we may not be seeing the black spot because of the varsity or the um, basically the distance between field pea crops because they've been a less popular option within Victoria in the last few years. But in South Australia, black spot, as per those pictures on the right, may be um, more of a concern for you, particularly where most areas were a high black spot risk through, through South Australia and Jenny is starting to see it um, through that. The other thing that I want to point out is the symptoms of bacterial blight, which are on the left-hand side there. Unfortunately, in season, we can't do anything about bacterial blight, whereas we can with black spot, and I'll go into the management of black spot in a second. But bacterial blight, once you start to get those water-soaked legions, as you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen, um, basically, you can't do anything in, in crop about that. It's the frost that's basically increased the temperature at which the tissue freezes at. So instead of the tissue freezing at say zero degrees or minus four degrees, it's freezing at that zero to two degrees. Um, and so those frost events where you're getting all those, those lower temperature events basically are now allowing that tissue to freeze and causing bacterial blight. Um, fungicides don't work on bacteria. Um, so you've basically just got to try and stay out of the paddock um, and monitor it um, from a distance. Harvest those areas later. Um, and hopefully we don't have too many frosts and don't get too much bacterial blight. But basically, if you kept seed off bacterial blight infected crops from last year, which we saw a lot out there, then bacterial blight will be an issue or potentially an issue for you this year. Um, so it's ensuring that you don't plant that seed that's infected with bacterial blight back into the soil for next year. In terms of black spot management, I'll now go on to that in season. So black spot management within, um, this is an average here of some results over, of three sites in 2016 from Victoria. We've got grain yield on the y-axis going from zero to four tonnes at the top. And we've got four varieties there um, by, four, by four fungicide treatments. Sorry, three fungicides and a nil. So the blue lines are an unprotected nil. We've then got a mancozeb in the grey and the yellow lines, um, yellow bars are our prothioconazole Bixifen, so Aviator X Pro, um, at eight node and flowering, so two applications of Aviator. And then our orange on the right hand side of each variety is our chlorothanolol fortnightly past six node. Basically, you can see there that there has been some yield increases due to these fungicides. Um, and it's, our recommendation is basically an eight node and a flowering spray. Um, and you'll see an improvement in yield basically from um, reduction in black spot. And that's in most of those varieties. We don't have any level of resistance at the moment that we're really seeing um, in black spot and field peas. PBA pearl, they're sort of, we're sort of umming and ahhing whether that's an, MR, an MRMS, whereas the others are all rated MS at the moment. So potentially there is a little bit um, of resistance. But in a normal year, basically, if you're keeping it for yield, your field peas, 
Um, you want an eight node um, spray and then another one at flowering to protect your seed. Um, in lower rainfall areas, you're sort of needing a one and a half ton. Previous research has shown that you need a one and a half ton yield potential before, you, before it's economic putting out a fungicide for black spot. So if you're not going to reach that one and a half ton yield potential, it's most likely not worth putting out um, economically a fungicide to protect against black spot. Whereas if you're over that one and a half ton yield potential, that eight node flowering um, is the recommendation or is best practice at the moment. So now just to summarise everything that I've gone through today, it's about monitoring for disease, understanding your risk in your, basically the season, the crop history. If you're planting chickpea on chickpea or lentil on lentil or lentil wheat lentil, you're going to be at a higher risk and need more fungicide applications than someone that's putting a chickpea or lentil in on a four year rotation, same with beans. It's about knowing your economics and knowing your yield potential and whether it's worth spraying fungicides because not all applications, um, not all situations require fungicide applications. It's optimising the fungicide strategy and following the product label. Spraying before the rainfall events, the rainfall events don't wash off the spray, they protect the canopy. Um, as most sprays are preventative and not curative. But after all, pulses are a very visual um, crop and basically that seed is sold by the visual inspection. So it's all about protecting the seed. You want to protect it from all those um, defectiveness, basically from um, disease. So just before I finish up, I've just got a couple of call outs and a couple of things to mention. I haven't mentioned anything on soil-borne diseases in this presentation, and that's because in pulses, we don't know much about soil-borne diseases. We're seeing a lot of root lesion nematodes. We're seeing rhizoctonia in pulses. But what disease is that actually causing? We're seeing pythium. We're actually seeing a little bit of phytophthora in the southeast of South Australia, um, southeast of South Australia, sorry, and in Western Victoria over in that Conagra area. So we've got a big survey across South, well, nationally actually under a new GRDC funded project um, within Victoria and South Australia. So there's some contacts on the screen there. And if you want to get involved in that, um, that would be fantastic. We'll come out in Victoria and sample or your agronomist can sample those worst patches of your paddocks if you're suspecting soilborne disease. We'll do a visual inspection and they're doing some molecular work at SARDI on all the samples across the southern region. And we're going to try and put it back into plants, put those diseases that we identify in your paddocks back into plants and see whether it's actually causing yield loss. And that's going to work out then whether we do any more work on those diseases and whether pulse, so pulses are seeing soilborne disease. So it's really important to get involved in that if you can. Um, sorry, the other thing that I had there is foliar diseases in that slide. Um, so we're also requesting foliar diseases um, and there's a call out for that at the moment um, with Sarah Blake and myself. So if you're seeing some of these Ascochyta, this is how we monitor what Ascochyta is doing within our environment and basically if you contact us, we'll give you sampling kits for either the soil-borne diseases or the pulse foliar diseases. So further information after this, we're happy for any of you to contact us or you can um, look at the Pulse Australia website so there's some good newsletters to follow. Um, there's Crop Alert in Victoria for email crop safe. Um, there's Crop Watch in South Australia and they provide in season what, summaries of what we're seeing and what to watch out for and follow some of us on Twitter. Um, so there's Crop Watch in SA or across the whole of the southern region, look at Crop diseases. So I'll probably call it to an end there and take any questions if anyone's got any questions. Thank you very much, Josh. That's fantastic. And um, we had over 50 registrations for this webinar. So certainly suggest that there's a lot of interest in what's happening in the pulse disease space at the moment. Um, I haven't got any questions in at the moment, but we've got a minute up our sleeves. So just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, there's a and a box down the bottom of your screen. If you hit that, you can type in your question. Well, I'll give you a minute to check and see if there are any quick questions out there. Um, this webinar has been recorded. If you would like to access this again or would you, if you would like to share it with somebody else, it should be available later this week on the GRDC YouTube channel.
Um, when you leave this webinar as well too, hopefully you should see a SurveyMonkey link pop up in your internet browser. It has a couple of super quick questions, should take you no more than a minute. If you can fill that out, that'll give us a good idea on how we can improve these webinars in the future. Um, this is also a monthly webinar that's happening this growing season, so please keep an eye out on GRDC social media channels for the next topic. Oh, Josh, we've got a quick question in. What's the best first fungicide on beans in high rainfall? The recommendation of what we're saying to put out is that tebiconazole because it controls both Cicospora as well as um, chocolate spot. Um, and that's basically what our recommendation is. Carbendism, we're trying to keep in, if you need to spray, there's a certain number of sprays or a certain amount of carbendism, I believe, that you can put out during the growing season. Um, so try and keep that in the bank in case you get a lot more rainfall during the season. Excellent. Thanks, Josh. Now it's bang on 2.30, so time to finish up. So thank you all for your attendance today and thank you again, Josh. Um, if you would like to be kept in the loop for future webinars or if you'd like to get in touch about anything related to pulses in the GRDC Southern region, please feel free to um, send me an email on prupru.cook, C-O-O-K, at bcg.org.au. Thank you very much, everyone.